All right, for more on the first day of the G7 meetings, James Moore, Jr., founder and CEO of the Washington Institute for Government, Business, and Society. Good to see you on the show. Um, big meeting at the G7. Uh, we all know what was discussed. How did you think the overall mood was at the meeting? It's, it's interesting because there's been much that's been happening in these individual countries. The G7, I think, uh, just like NATO these days, is more unified, uh, more committed to the future together in being able to deal with a number of, uh, of concerns. Uh, there were two countries very much in their mind. Russia was at the top of the agenda, and I think China was not far behind. Do you think that the, the G7, when they look at what they've done over the past three months, um, as, in essence, to fend off the Russian aggression here in Ukraine, do you think they look back and go, was there anything that they could have done different perhaps having a more positive outcome? Well, I think one could argue that perhaps uh, weaponry could have been delivered uh, much more quickly than it was, uh, that there could have been more modern uh, uh, weaponry that uh, came into play, uh, 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 some of which is coming in right now. It could have been a little earlier. So I think that that's the only concern. Um, you know, there, quite frankly, there was not a, I think, fundamental understanding, and we certainly can see that from the past, uh, that uh, uh, Russia would actually invade Ukraine. I mean, we must remember that the G7 was at one time the G8 not too long ago, and it became the G7 after Russia was, uh, was, was told to leave the group of G8 after it had invaded Odessa. And so here we are in an interesting situation where we're dealing with Russia once again, uh, and in this time, it's uh, really trying to not only defend the sovereignty of Ukraine, but also to anticipate what Russia might have in mind for other countries that are within NATO and on the border. Right. And I, and I suspect that, you know, China, India, and a whole slew of other countries, big and small, would like this conflict to come to an end as soon as possible. And I'm sure the G7 feels that way. Th does it feel like we're going to have a resolution to this in the near future? It doesn't feel like it, but the fact is, is that this war is not just having an impact, economic impact on Ukraine, <clears> on <throat> the Ukrainians. Rather, it's having an impact around the world. Uh, we're, we, we saw that there were, for example, in the country of Sudan, there were serious problems facing that country and its people as a result of climate change. But adding the fact that wheat deliveries from Ukraine, which has always been known as Europe's uh, breadbasket, uh, was being denied. The Sudanese has been creating uh, great, uh, great problems. And so we're seeing this sort of thing being played out around the world. And so the faster this can be resolved, the better. So we, you know, after we saw what happened, which was just reported on air here uh, at, with the mall, in which there have been a number of people that have been killed, it seems like this could go on for a while. But the hope on the part of Pre President Putin is that uh, the West will become more weary. I think the declaration that was made by the G7 makes it abundantly clear that the G7 certainly is prepared to go all the way to uh, for however long it takes to be able to deal with this war. Right. I mean, the G7 might not be wary, but the public's getting pretty tired of all these horrific scenes that we're seeing, whether it's schools or whether it's malls being demolished. And, you bet. And, and some experts are saying, and, and this, by the way, I don't think it's a huge minority opinion, but some experts think that perhaps Ukraine should give up what they've lost to Russia up to this point to save the remaining lives and, and save the remaining, I, I guess, infrastructure that's still in place and not let Russia ultimately, with what it appears to be destroying much of the rest of it, no? Well, you know, Secretary, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger made that comment not long ago. Uh, at Davos, uh, talking about the fact that uh, perhaps Ukraine is going to have to give up certain territory. I think more than anything, President Zelensky uh, and uh, and his uh, and his his government are trying to make sure that <clears throat> before they go to the table for any kind of talks with Russia, that they're able to hold on to as much land as they possibly can. Um, this is going to be a very interesting outcome. Uh, again, this is something that the world has not seen since World War II. Right. We really are forging into new territory. And how this all ends up uh, is going to be a key to what the future is going to look like, I right. think, for the entire globe. J James, is there any other countries potentially that could step up, whether India or China or any other nation that maybe has 
Putin's ear that could maybe get a resolution here that has a more positive outcome? Honestly, I don't. I think that could have happened. Uh, if it were to happen, it could have happened a, a little while ago. I, certainly China and certainly India are very concerned about what has been transpiring. But I don't think Vladimir Putin right now is ready to be swayed by any country. Um, he is continuing to try to figure out how to be able to sustain uh, the economic uh, well-being of, of Russia, which is becoming more and more difficult. But I think he's ready to go to the very ends of the uh, of the earth to be able to make sure that Russia uh, continues to remain whole, but also is able to gain the kind of lands that it's wanted to with Ukraine. James Moore, Jr., um, CEO of the Washington Institute for Business, thank you very much for joining us and your insights on this.